I know my heart is filled. And, that, and that's, again, I'm so glad that we're here and we can gather in a place like this and just be reminded there's a God who loves us so much. And, and that's what it's all about. And that's why we gather here. That's what we celebrate in this place. That's when we say, hey, helping people discover what life with Jesus is all about. It's because in Jesus, you discover this incredible love. And we're going to talk about that. In fact, that's what we always talk about here. And hey, before we dive into that, a few things uh, about, you know, things that are going on around here. Uh, man, glad you're involved. Glad you're here. I hope you had a great summer. It's kind of tapering down, winding to an end. And, and yet, but there's lots of things happening. So check out your programs. And a couple things, guys, uh, we got our Faithful Men's Trip, uh, end of August. Hopefully you can make it with us. Great time. Ladies, next Saturday, paddleboard uh, event out there for a Get Out Adventure. So hopefully you can join them. But something that we just kind of embarked on, we've done it a few months now, kind of partnered with the ministry and, and we're kind of moving it to a new night. But we're doing these community meals for the community needs in our area. And every third Saturday of the month, we actually, on our patio here, we provide a meal for our community. And, and we, you know, again, we, we draw people who are homeless or in transition, and it's open to anybody who has a need. And, and so we've asked for some donations. I think you've seen that and appreciate those who've donated for that cause. But this one coming up, um, we, we have a special request, guys, for you. Um, Usually there's a couple guys who hang out and, and you just kind of just, you know, monitor things, you know, just presence, whatever. And for whatever reason, this third Saturday, uh, a lot of the normal guys who can, are usually there aren't going to be there. So I'm asking you guys, if you could help out this, the third Saturday, I believe it's the 17th, uh, if you could just show up and be a presence there, okay? And we don't need 50 of you. <laughs> it's like, we just need about five of you guys. So if, if you want to help out, just fill out the communication card. Let us know. And we'd really appreciate your presence there. Uh, because again, God's doing some really cool things. And it's our desire as a church to be faithful to what God asks us to be as a church. And really, a faithful church is just really reflecting his love to everyone who needs it. And in fact, today we're going we're gonna to talk about that. And uh, you know, we've, uh, we're wrap, we've been doing our Well-Versed series throughout the summer. It's been really cool because we've asked uh, our staff and some friends to speak to all of us about the verses from Scripture that have impacted their life. And it was supposed to wrap up last week, but, but I got thinking, and I'm going ahead and we're going to extend it one more week because this, this past, uh, about two weeks ago, I was doing my uh, kind of just, I, I like to read the news headlines and stuff. And, and I read a news headline about a bill that was in the California Assembly recently. And the bill was written for anti-discrimination. And so that people would discriminate less. And, you know, in that regard, it's a good thing because discrimination, you know, lack of a better term, is, <laughs> sucks. You know, it's, like, it's not supposed to be there. And yet somebody read this bill and they said, but you can interpret this language that would take away the freedoms for us to be able to read our Bibles in public settings. Well, like you wouldn't be able to take your Bible. Someone could interpret it in the fact that it would limit us to take our Bibles to school, to Starbucks, have it on a phone. And, and luckily, and, and, and in a good manner, when they recognized that, they changed the wording. So it gave us the ability to continue to freely pursue our, uh, our beliefs and our religion and, and have Bibles, right? But it got me thinking, what if you and I lost the privilege to carry around God's word? What if you and I in this country today, was, were, that freedom was taken away from us? And you may be thinking, oh, it'll never happen, right? Did you know today there's 52 countries in this world, it's illegal to own a Bible, and it's limited in your ability to have one and read it? I and mean, that's in this world today. And, and, and I'm thankful we're in a free country. We have a right to make, we have a stand and, and we're, we're grounded on Christian principles that there's a good chance in our lifetime it won't be taken away. But what if it was? And with that question, I thought, gosh, if God's word is ever taken away from us, what is one thing and one thing that God's word says that we could never afford to forget? And it's important that you and I will always remember. Which takes us to the, the final, 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 final installment of our well verse series. And this one verse I want to look at, which I think perfectly encapsulates everything that God wants us to know about him and what we're supposed to do. And it's John 3.16. And maybe you've heard it, maybe you know it. It's the most memorized and recognizable scripture in all the Bible. And John 3, 16 reads like this, and I'm gonna ask you to read it with me. And hey, maybe you know it, try not to peek. <laughs> it reads like this, let's do it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's a good verse, great verse. Such an important verse. In fact, maybe you discovered that verse because you were watching a football game once and you saw a guy on a rainbow wig with a sign that says John 3.16 and you had to figure out what the heck does John 3.16 say, right? Well, that's what John 3.16 says. It's one of those verses that if you and I completely understand the depths of it, it's not that we'll never have to read the Bible again, 
but will understand why gave us, God gave us his word and what he wants us to truly know. In fact, to help us understand this verse, I think it's important that we look at the context in which it's involved. I mean, something about when we read the Bible, we never want to take something out and think we understand it without understanding the context in which it played out. And this, this verse was something Jesus said to a guy named Nicodemus when Nicodemus sought out a meeting with Jesus. Now, the interesting thing in John 3, it explains the scenario and the situation. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, meaning he was a religious leader in the nation of Israel. And at that time, Nicodemus wasn't so sure about this Jesus guy. In fact, the, the story goes that he met Jesus in the middle of the night because of his concerns about being known to be talking to this Jesus, this highly controversial guy. See, Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, was wondering what this conversation might cost him, most likely. If I go out and meet this Jesus guy, it's, it might cost me something. Because days before this meeting, Jesus showed up in Jerusalem, showed up in the temple, and he saw things were wrong at the temple. And Jesus, and that's the story where he kicked out the, the, the money changers, those who were charging high in, interest on money exchanges unfairly to people, ripping them off, and, and those who were trading for the things that were to be sacrificed at the temple. Again, uh, elevated rates and, and, and costs. And Jesus saw this corruption going on in his father's temple, kicks everyone out, and why this was so controversial is because he did it in the very center of the Pharisees' world. This is where the Pharisees gathered and, and they were, knew this was going on and they kind of okayed it. And yet what Jesus did should have got him arrested. But Jesus wasn't arrested because everyone knew what Jesus did was right. So here's Nicodemus wondering about this controversial figure. In fact, in the first part of the meeting, he says, we know you're from God because nobody could do the things that you're doing if he wasn't. In fact, anybody else would have been arrested. Anybody else wouldn't have had that authority. Anybody else, man, again, you wouldn't be standing here as a free man today. So he seeks him out in the middle of the night. And we discover this incredible conversation that Jesus has with this very intelligent man who thinks he knows what God's all about. And it's in the midst of that conversation where Jesus kind of lets him know that, hey, as Israel's teacher, someone who should know these things of God, why is it you don't? And then he lays some things out. He says, you know, for you, Nicodemus, I want you to know, God's like the wind. And we never know where the wind's gonna go. It's unpredictable. It's because Jesus didn't fit the package that Nicodemus was expecting a man from God to look like and act like and be like. And so he was saying to Nicodemus, as smart as you are, you gotta realize, man, you have no idea how God's gonna do what God's gonna do because he's like the wind. And then from that, Nicodemus was confused. And so Jesus then laid out another very thing that we've probably heard about. He says, Nicodemus, if you really want to understand what God's all about, if you really understand this, this new reality of God for you, a paradigm shift, you have to be born again. Now Nicodemus, Nicodemus, this intelligent guy, is really backed off because he's like, what? I'm supposed to enter my mom's womb? That's impossible. And Jesus kind of probably chuckles at him and says, no, man, what I'm telling you is unless you're really, uh, unless you're willing to reconfigure everything you understand about God. He says, you'll never understand how much and what God's all about. In fact, in this one statement, what we learn and we see from Nicodemus, Nicodemus thought he knew God. But from this one verse, we're going to realize that there's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing him personally. There's a big difference between knowing about God and knowing him personally. In fact, when we break this verse down, I think we discover two things about God and two things that you and I have to realize because of it. And the first thing we realize from this verse, John 3, 16, is that God loves everyone. For God so loved the world. God loves everyone. There's no doubt about it. In fact, Jesus came out with that very bold statement. And in fact, the reason this was probably hard for Nicodemus to hear and understand is because of the word that Jesus chose to use. Two words particularly. The first one was world. It's the word in Greek, cosmos, meaning all of creation everything. And God loves his creation, loves his world, loves his cosmos and everything about it. God loves it. No doubt about it. And then he uses another word and that whoever believes, whoever hears this, whoever is a part of this world and creation, God loves. And see, the word there was pos, and that means everything and everyone. And see, the reason that this would be hard for Nicodemus is because Nicodemus understood that God loved. But Really, his belief was that God loved Israel and the Jewish nation and put up with everybody else. 
See, Nicodemus saw that God had a special place in his plan for Israel. But what Nicodemus failed to realize was just because God loved Israel doesn't mean he didn't love everyone else. And this was a paradigm shift for Nicodemus. This statement says that God loves every tribe, every nation, every color, every gender, every person in this world in his creation. And see, and, and there's often a misconception when it comes to our understanding about God's love that somehow God will love us on a scale that's sometimes higher and sometimes lower depending on how we live our lives. And see, Nicodemus was caught up into this. Nicodemus believed that God was a performance God. That the better he performed, the more God loved him. And that when he didn't perform, God didn't love him. And see, it's a dangerous way to think when you realize that, that you think that we can affect God's love for us. And I think we, I get why we get caught up into it. I don't know if you've ever done something and you maybe someone clapped or applauded or slapped you on the back and said, good job. And the sense was, wow, they like me now. They must love me more because of the things that I did. And our world is kind of revolves around that mentality. And we fall into that, that, hey, the better I perform, the more people love me and appreciate me. See, but God's not wired that way. God, God doesn't do it that way. There's nothing that we do that, that can please God. God loves us no matter what. Hey, if we do well, God loves us. If we don't do well, if we fail, God loves us the same. In fact, I think I understand it from a, like a parent's perspective. You know, I love my children. I have two children, fully grown now, off on their own. But, but I love my children. And, and, and throughout my life, they've done things that have disappointed me. But it didn't mean I didn't love them. Sure, I was disappointed in them, right? And I, the reason I was disappointed is because I saw the effect that what they did would have on their life. Not because I didn't love them. In fact, my, my daughter, when she was 18, she got her first traffic ticket. She did an illegal U-turn in an intersection. And there's a good chance she'd gotten away with it if a cop wasn't right behind her and saw the whole thing, right? So, so I, of course, when she told me, I, I was disappointed, right? But I was disappointed because of how it was going to affect her life. She was going to have to pay a ticket. She was going to have to go through things. And then I got really disappointed when I realized it was going to raise my insurance premiums, right? <laughs> That's a whole different story, right? And we understand that disappointment. It doesn't change my love for my children at all. But I, I will be disappointed because I see the effects. In fact, what God sees is what a parent of a child addicted to drugs sees. See, God sees, or a parent sees a child they love desperately. And they hate what those drugs are doing to the child's life. And see, and God loves everyone. But he hates the effect that a broken world has on us. He hates the effect that the broken world has on relationships, has on choices, has on behaviors. God does not love that, but he loves the world. And see, and God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. And see, what we learn from that is that God initiated his grace to everyone. It was God who initiated this movement of grace to understand that we would, are, are loved by him. Outside of that, we get stuck in this performance mode that we have to earn God's love. And, and, but yet God said, no, 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 I love you. And I'm going to initiate that grace to prove it. The Greek word for grace is uh, diadome. And uh, excuse me, to give is diadome. And it's, it's to give out of desperation. It's not like you wanted a piece of gum and I had some and I gave you a piece of gum. That's not what this word means. It means you're about to die. And if I don't give you this meal, you will die. That's the strength of this word gave. And see, God gave everything so that we could have everything he wanted for us. And see, again, Nicodemus wasn't expecting this. His understanding was that, no, you only receive from God what you got from, what you deserved or what you earned. Again, he got caught up in this performance mode. His whole life, it was like, I had to follow the law and do what I was supposed to do so that I could understand what God wanted for me, receive what God would give me. And this, this, again, was something difficult for him to understand and hear. And Jesus is saying, no, I gave it for you. In fact, what Nicodemus was caught up into was the idea of religion. That the more I do, the more God loves me. The more I do, the more God will bless me. And see, the problem is, and what Jesus is laying out to him is, there's nothing you can do. There was nothing we could do to, to fix the broken relationship that God gave, had. So he had to initiate it. In fact, what we couldn't do he did for us. And see, that's the difference between the religion and relationship. A religion is do, do, do. The, the, excuse me, a religion is do, do, do. The relationship, realize it's already been done for you. And, and it's just a response to love. And in reality, what Jesus said because of his love is he was going to do it for us. And God gave us Jesus to reveal his grace because without it, we wouldn't have a chance. 
With God, God initiating this movement of grace and his love towards us, we would have been forever stuck in this broken understanding of who God was and what he was all about. And so God initiates that. God sends it to us. In fact, the definition of grace is undeserved favor, meaning we get something we don't deserve. And I've always explained grace like this. It's like if you mess up at work real bad and you get called into your boss's office and you think you're going to get fired and instead your boss gives you a raise. That's, that's what grace really is all about. We deserve to be fired. We deserve to be let go. But God in his great love initiated grace and gave us the opportunity to pursue the things that we didn't deserve, the things he wanted for us. See, God gave everything so that we could have everything he wanted for us. That's a God who loves. That's a God who gives. It's a God of grace. And we need, and so for, in regards to this everything, the verse goes on and he says, it's available to everyone, whoever believes. And what we realize there is that when it comes to this idea of love and grace, we need to choose to trust him in everything. It's on us to, to not just know about it, but to pursue it and allow it to affect our lives. And again, when it came to Nicodemus, for him, the, the challenge for him was that he, there's, in the Hebrew language, there's no word for obey. Uh, again, it's to be like obedience or response. Uh, when Jesus is saying, hey, you, everyone who believes, everyone who puts their full confidence and trust in me gets to receive everything that God wants. No action, no duties, no responsibilities, just this belief. And, and belief is this idea is a full trust and confidence. Now, when it comes to faith, it's kind of like the stool. And I can say I have faith that this stool will hold me on my way, but unless I sit on it, I really don't believe it. I'm not acting on it. Now, now I can lean on it. I can say, I have faith in this, but is that my, all my faith? Is that all my confidence, all my trust? No, it's just a little bit. Or, or I can maybe lean on it a little bit, right? And I can stand like this, but is that putting all my confidence and trust in this stool? No, it's really not. It may look like it, may act like it, but until I'm willing to say, I'm gonna put everything I've got on this thing, am I completely trusting and believing that this stool will hold everything about my life? And see what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, he says, hey, if you believe I'm from God, if you know that the things that I've done are true, then you need to put your full confidence and trust in who I am and what I say. And see the challenge for Nicodemus is he's already there in the middle of the night. He's already there wondering what's this gonna cost him, his position, his reputation, his influence, his, maybe his livelihood, maybe his securities. Maybe everything that he's banked on in this world is suddenly at risk because he has to put his full confidence and trust in this man who says he's from God. And see, that's what faith is really all about. That's why we, when we do life with Jesus, it's not just him or a buddy, buddy. It's him being Lord of our life. And not because... There we go, back. Not because um, he dominates our life, not because he wants to control our life, but because we're willing to submit and put our full confidence and trust in everything that he says for us. That, that's what it means to believe in him. Whoever believes in him. In fact, when it comes to the idea of belief, if, if you were sick and you went to a doctor and the doctor says, hey, take this medicine, it'll make you better. If you believe what he says, you'll take the medicine, right? If you don't believe it, you won't take it. In fact, if you don't care, you'll ignore it. See, Jesus says, whoever believes, whoever puts their full confidence and trust in the things that I say and who I am and what I desire for you, that's what belief is all about. It's allowing Jesus to be Lord of our life. But it might cost us everything. In fact, the cool part about this is we see that Nicodemus does believe in Jesus. We don't know where he's at that night, but eventually he steps out of that dark place in that shadowed place of his relationship with Jesus, and he steps into the light of the reality of believing and trusting everything. In John chapter seven, we see that Nicodemus speaks up at a Sanhedrin, a, a, a council of all the Pharisees on Jesus' behalf. He speaks on him publicly. In John 19, we see that Nicodemus is present at Jesus' burial. He's the one who wraps his body. He's the one who prepares him for burial. Has no idea about the resurrection gonna happen just yet. But here he steps into the light. In fact, that's really what belief is all about. In fact, when we see that in Nicodemus's life, we realize for you and I, 
that he receives something that this verse tells us. Because the one thing that when it comes to this idea of believing in Christ, when we do, we get everything God wants for us. We absolutely get everything God wants for us. See, Jesus says this in the verse. He says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And now the word he uses for life here is the word zoe. And it means to live life with vitality, to thrive in life. And, and what did Jesus say? I came that you might have life in all of its fullness. I came and I revealed and I, I, I revealed God's love and I, I initiated the grace because God wants you to live a life that he's always dreamed for you from the very beginning, before everything went south, before the world got broken. He says, that's what I'm offering you. Life today and for all eternity. And see, Jesus said that he came to bring God's kingdom to earth. God's kingdom come. And what that means is when we put our full trust and confidence in God and Jesus, we begin right now to experience the very things he wants for us that are available for all eternity. Oh, it's gonna be so much better in eternity when the brokenness is gone. But in the midst of our lives, we can live a life that God wants for us, a life that's vital filled with vitality. We can thrive in the midst of impossible things because God says, Jesus said, you have the ability to experience God's kingdom right here, right now. And in contrast, he says, you shall not perish. Now, perish is an interesting word. It means to be lost forever. Think about that. Lost forever. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't like losing anything. <laughs> uh, you lose your car keys, you misplace your cell phone. It's like, I don't want to lose anything. But, but worse is I don't want to ever get lost. And if you've ever been lost, you know that feeling. It's helpless. I, I remember uh, I've hiked Mount Whitney and I, I actually made it to the top, the, the ascent, after three tries. And it was the second try with a group of guys that I had that uh, we got snowed out. And a freak snowstorm in the middle of May, right? It was like one of those things you could actually probably make a movie about this one, right? It's like, because the snowstorm came in the middle of the night. One of the guys in our group kind of freaked out and he left. He started hiking down all by himself. We wake up in the morning, he's gone. And so we have to make this decision like, okay, we need to go and look for this guy because he might get lost in the wilderness, right? And in the meantime, as we're trying to navigate these trails all covered in snow, we get lost, right? We have no idea where we're at. I don't know if you've ever been out lost in the wilderness, but some weird stuff starts happening up here, right? I mean, you start thinking, oh my gosh, what if we get lost? What if no one ever finds our bodies? You know, it's like, and how are we going to split up this last Hershey bar? It's like all these things, you know, it's like, like these crazy thoughts. Man, there's nothing worse than getting lost or being lost. And what did Jesus say? I came to seek that which was lost. I came because there's people who are lost in this world who have no idea about this God and his great love who initiated this amazing grace to us because he wants us to have life eternal. And so there's people out there that are lost and wandering. It's not their fault. It's just don't know about God's love. And when we know about God's love, then people will discover God's love. And see, that's why John 3, 16 is so important for you and I. Jesus came to seek that which was lost. And we have the ability to discover God's love and to live out God's love so that no one ever has to perish and be lost forever. I don't know about you, but over the last 24 hours, pretty disturbing headlines going on in our world. I mean, it was, we mentioned it at our pre-service meeting last night about the shooting in El Paso and just tragic, crazy. And this morning we wake up that another one happened in Dayton, Ohio. Unbelievable what's going on in our world today. It's a world desperate need of love. A world desperate need and the hope that's only from one place and that's in Christ. And you know, I, I don't know how to uh, correct the problems of this world, but I know God just asked me and you to be faithful, to understand the truth of John 3, 16 and to live that out so that people could know life and love. And I don't know if anything would have prevented these guys from doing what they did, but maybe it could have. Maybe someone who knew them could have reached into their lives and, and shared with them a real love that would allow them to never do something as tragic and senseless as take a gun and kill innocent people. But the truth is, maybe you're here today and maybe you have reached out in love to someone and without even knowing it, you've prevented someone from doing something. Maybe not that tragic, but something tragic in their own life because of the power of love. And see, and I think that's the real message of John 3, 16. There's a God who loved the world so much, he gave everything so that we would know that life. And through that life, we would be able to help people not perish, not be lost, but to be found in relationship 
with the God who created us and loves them as well. I think it's the most important verse you and I could know and live by, and we can never afford to forget it. So as we close this one up, you want to read it with me one more time? John 3, 16. Let's give it our best. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's my hope that you and I will have that eternal life. A couple things that I, I, God put on my heart that I want to just kind of speak to you personally on right now. You know, in the story of Nicodemus, Jesus compared God to wind. And so you, I, I don't know where you're at in your life right now, but maybe, you know, you don't like the wind that God's blowing in your life right now. Uh, maybe the faith you have, you don't like what God's doing. You don't understand that he's changing directions. In fact, you don't like the winds of change at all. Well, let me encourage you because God... The only reason he blows the wind that he does and he does the things that we'll never understand is because he loves you and wants what's best for you. So maybe it's time to reconfigure the, the resistance of what God's doing and to set your cells to him and allow his wind to fill your cells and to propel you to a new understanding and a new way to realize the love and the grace that he has for you and the purposes of your life. Jesus also talked to Nicodemus about being born again. Now we all have these days when we were born and we celebrate them every year with a birthday cake and some candles and maybe you get to pick the place you go out to eat, right? We do that every year. It's the marker of our life. Well, Jesus said that there's a point in our life and our existence when everything becomes renewed. The way we understand God, we don't just know about him, but we begin to know him personally. And Jesus says, that's a mark called a born again moment. And a lot of scholars believe Jesus is referencing the moment of baptism where you go public in your faith, where you say, I'm not afraid to step into these waters that signify my public declaration that I'm committed to do life with Jesus. And maybe for you, you, you've been doing life with Jesus, but you've never stepped in obedience into those waters. Let me encourage you to do that, to make it a marker, to say, I've been born again. I'm doing life with Jesus. I'm stepping out of the darkness into the light of what God wants for me. And I believe when we do those things, set our winds to God's, our sails to God's wind, and we go public in our faith, that's when we're well on our way to experience everything God wants for us because he gave everything so we could do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this one verse, Lord, that's so recognizable in the world. And God, it's my belief that, man, if everyone in this world who knew and memorized this verse actually lived out the tenets of it, what it means for us, what it means about our understanding of who you are, God, this world will be such a better place. This world will reflect the very things that you desire us of your church to show the world your love and who you are and, and the potential we all have versus hiding corners because we're so afraid of what's happening in this world. God, allow us to be your people who show the world your great love, who live out that grace so that we all can pursue the life that only comes from you. So thanks, God. Pray all these things in Jesus' name who makes it possible. Amen.